Hello, I'm Matt Teal and welcome to the Military Tech Show. I'll be bringing you the latest in defence and security technology that could change the future for the military across the world. Coming up on the show. Best-selling author Mary Roach on the more unusual science helping soldiers at war. We visit the German Aerospace Centre using radar to create groundbreaking images of the Earth. The highly technical engineering work that keeps French jets in the sky. And could this be the answer to clearing minefields? The German scientists taking a radical approach to finding hidden explosives. Now, best-selling American author Mary Roach has explored the science behind some of the more unusual military research for her latest book. Called Grunts, it focuses on the quiet battles against less obvious enemies. We caught up with the writer at the Imperial War Museum in London. My book is about military science, but it's not new weapons and bombs and the things and strategy, the things that most people associate with military science. It's more, not the killing, but the keeping alive. So it's about extreme heat and heavy loads and flies and diarrhea and all the things that you have to deal with if you're a soldier. It's just the, the quiet victories and struggles that don't lend themselves to a feature length Tom Hanks movie. Stink bomb is a bad smell that is used by the military to clear a room, say, clear an insurgent compound or disperse an angry mob. It's not just a bad, disgusting, horrible, intolerable smell, but there is a, this is the, the, the wicked brilliance of uh, the, uh, the stink bomb that I experienced anyway. It has a fruity floral top note. So, you know, when you encounter a smell, you take a little tentative whiff, so you get this little, oh, that's not bad. So that encourages you to take a deep breath, and then you get hit with the full-on nastiness of the stink bomb. There's a lab in, I visited in Philadelphia, the Monell Chemical Census Center, where they are pros in the malodorant community. They came up with this thing called stench soup. And what's, what's unique about stench soup is that it was tested in different cultures all around the world. Uh, they tried to find what is the one smell in any culture that everyone agrees is horrible and frightening and awful. Because some of them say sewage or vomit in some cultures, uh, like something like 3% of Caucasians will go, yeah, I'd wear that as a scent. Or yeah, that's an edible smell. You know, but, the, the, but this one stench soup is uh, no one. No one wants to eat it, wear it, smell it, be anywhere near it. The challenge of noise in the military is you can protect someone's ears by giving them earplugs or an ear cuff, but then they lose their situational awareness. They can't hear somebody coming up behind them. They can't communicate, can't have a conversation with someone on their foot patrol. Uh, so they tend not to wear their hearing protection. There's a new system, TCAPS, Tactical Communication and Protection System, uh, and you put this on, it's got a mouthpiece, you put it on and it takes loud noises and makes them quieter and it amplifies something quiet like a human voice. So now you can have a conversation, even there's noise and loud noises going on around you, that's not going to damage your hearing. And the, the microphone allows you to communicate with, say, someone in a helicopter overhead, wireless communication. One of the places I went for the book was uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground, and the project was called We A Man, the Warrior Injury Assessment Mannequin. It's essentially a crash test dummy for underbody blast. So you could evaluate um, uh, an armored personnel carrier, uh, make sure that if a huge bomb goes off right underneath it, the blast coming up from below, is, this, is it going to keep people safe inside? The only way to know that, you need a crash test dummy specifically for this scenario. To make a good crash test dummy, you need cadavers. A cadaver is essentially a human body. Uh, these are people who've donated their remains to science. They, and, and because the military is very sensitive about the use of cadavers for anything kind of destructive, um, they have to have signed specific consent. So they have to know that this is what I'm going to be used for. Sounds gruesome. Actually, not so much. The cadavers are in a, in a sort of, the, they've got the seats on a platform, C4 buried, explosives buried below, goes off below. You, and if you see it, they just kind of, you know, they go like that. They take them off, autopsy them, and they look to see, you know, are bones broken? What's going on? 
you know, what sort of injuries would you have with this, these seats and that kind of a blast. So I spent time on the USS Tennessee, which is a ballistic missile submarine. The US Navy is trying to shift away from the watch bill that is based on six hour chunks, because that actually creates an 18 hour day, which messes with your circadian rhythm. Even if there's no light coming in on a submarine, which, you know, there's no cues of daylight, your body still prefers to be on a 24 hour cycle. Uh, so they're trying to put the sailors back on that 24 hour cycle. Because for a long time, there was this thought that because no light's coming in, we can create a day of any length we want. We can make it as, you know, a work schedule that will be maximally efficient. So they had them on this kind of brutal schedule of, of six hour watches that created the kind of 18 hour day rather than 24. So they're taking it back to um, something a little more humane, yeah. The German Aerospace Center, or DLR, is Germany's national center for space, energy and climate research, but their work is also proving helpful for their armed forces. The military tech show was given rare access to their labs outside Munich, where their scientists are using a clever form of satellite radar to create high-resolution images of the Earth, unhindered by darkness or weather. Almost everything we take for granted is the result of satellites, television channels, smartphones, GPS. They're also used for surveillance. The German Aerospace Center, or DLR, is at the forefront of space exploration. It operates the radars of two satellites using a radical technology that creates images of very high quality. Their scientists are breaking new ground with a process called SAR, or Synthetic Aperture Radar. They are very high resolution satellites capable to, make, to image the Earth's surface with a resolution down to 25 centimeters. And this independent on the weather, independent on the daylight illumination. So it's a very uh, unique technique that we have to image the Earth's surface. The satellite Terra-SAR-X was launched in 2007 and uses SAR technology. So what is it? To achieve a high resolution image, you would need an antenna at least 15 kilometers in length, and that's not really practical in space. So a smaller antenna sends microwave signals towards an illuminated spot on the ground from several different points along the satellite's orbit and captures the returning echoes. In effect, it does the work of a 15 kilometer one. The data is sent back to Earth, where the center's scientists use it to create a high-resolution image. It helps that microwaves can pass through clouds, fog and precipitation and provide imagery regardless of day or night. TerraSAR-X also works alongside the appropriately named satellite Tandem-X and together they combine to create 3D images. Both satellites are flying in formation with a distance of about 100 to 300 meters and together they make a big stereo imaging system uh, and uh, with that we have generated the most accurate global topography of the Earth ever. Today we are able with our mobile phone to know our position using GPS and Galileo with a few meters accuracy, one, two meters, and this we no need for navigation. But how you can navigate if you don't know the topography? So then on the top of this, uh, of knowing our position with a navigation system, we need to know the Earth's topography with accuracy that is similar to the navigation uh, system accuracy. To see how extraordinary the results are, take a look at these images of a garden in Munich. These can be achieved during darkness as radar sensors combined with algorithms can illuminate the scene like a flashlight. Armed forces were the first users of SAR, but the technology is now in wider use. The radar technology in space came from the military area. So back to the end of the 70s, we had the first uh, satellites in space and this was a technique that was pushed by the military. Today uh, the applications for environmental, for climate research and so on are so big that this technique is exploding in the civilian um, domain and this, for this we have a number of uh, technologies that are now more advanced 
in the civilian applications than in the military. So then now today, many, many of the innovations are coming from the civilian, civilian world into the military world. To ensure SAR delivers accurate data, you need to enter the world of blue cones. Now this is one of the places that's crucial to research being conducted at the German Aerospace Center. And here at the compact test range, they're really making waves. This might look like something out of James Bond, but it's an echo-free chamber used for measuring and calibrating antenna. Microwaves have beamed off two mirrors onto the antenna. This one is fitted into an aircraft part for airborne radar. The cones are absorbers that prevent stray microwave reflections. There are 50,000 altogether, and it took 13 trucks to deliver them. The results are later analyzed using a rotational animation. Scientists at the German Aerospace Center are developing other uses for SAR, and as we shall see later, their research could help locate and clear landmines. Well, that's it for now, but coming up in part two, the engineer who keeps the jets flying on the French carrier Charles de Gaulle, and how microwave radar could help clear minefields. Welcome back to the Military Tech Show. The French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle is the largest warship in Western Europe. On board are a squadron of 24 Rafale twin-engine jets on constant operation. And as we find out, their engines take quite a bit of looking after. Bienvenue à bord du porte-avions Charles de Gaulle. Nous sommes ici à l'atelier moteur du Charles de Gaulle, plus précisément au bord des réacteurs. Donc tous les moteurs qui passent au, à l'atelier vont donc passer ici pour un essai de, de bon fonctionnement du moteur. Donc pour n'importe quelle partie qui va être démontée, tout le moteur va être contrôlé, ses paramètres, les fuites, etc. Tout son bon fonctionnement avant de partir. Donc en gros, une fois que le moteur est accroché, on a pour une demi-heure, trois quarts d'heure de, de point fixe en gros. Donc pour vous expliquer un peu le, ce moteur, c'est le M88, le moteur du Rafale. Donc l'avion est équipé de deux moteurs. Donc là, vous en avez un là, qui est venu chez nous pour, pour une échéance. En fin de compte, c'était pour une échéance de maintenance. Donc le, le moteur a été réparé. Et donc maintenant, on va le tester. Donc en fin de compte, vous avez... L'entrée d'air qui est par là, donc tout ce qui est flux d'air qui vient par là, avec les gaz d'échappement qui sortent de l'autre côté. On vient plaquer la buse ici. Donc là, vous avez tout ce qui est carter d'entrée avec un compresseur. Donc c'est un double flux, double corps, double flux, donc avec deux, deux compresseurs, deux turbines. Donc ce moteur est un moteur modulaire, c'est-à-dire que vous pouvez changer un module par un module, que ce soit à l'avant, à l'arrière, une turbine, un compresseur. Donc là, vous avez le carte d'entrée, suivi du compresseur BP. Euh, en dessous, là, vous avez à ce niveau-là le compresseur haute, haute pension, HP. Toute cette partie-là, c'est en carbone pour le gain de poids et de robustesse. Donc en dessous, là, vous ne le voyez pas, donc les compresseurs, les chambres de combustion et les turbines. Une fois que c'est sorti, vous avez ici tout ce qui est post-combustion. C'est un moteur avec la post-combustion. Donc tout le module qui est ici, sert à tout ce qui est post-combustion et à la fin vous avez la tuyère d'échappement avec les volets pour tout ce qui est régulation moteur fait aussi en carbone. À l'arrière vous avez donc l'éjection le... des gaz et ce qui se fait à l'arrière. Donc ici par rapport au bâtiment on est situé à l'arrière, complètement à l'arrière du bâtiment. Euh... Ce moteur a été fait en fin de compte pour être que le maximum d'équipement soit déposé en ligne. Donc euh, sur avion, en fin de compte, euh, une fois que les capots sont enlevés, euh, vous avez à peu près cette, à ce niveau-là. Il y a beaucoup qui est fait en flottille, en flottille rafale. Soit les, les calculateurs qui peuvent être démontés, tout ce qui est les blocs hydromécaniques, tout ce qui est régulation tuyère, PC, post-combustion, etc. et carburant. 
Donc euh, ce moteur-là, en fin de compte, est équipé de deux calculateurs qui se contrôlent chaque fois l'un et l'autre. Tant que, tant que tout va bien, tant que les mêmes valeurs sont par équipement, par actionneur, tant qu'il n'y a pas de, de biais, on appelle ça, il n'y aura pas de remontée de panne. Si un jour, il y a une voie qui ne se voit pas comme l'autre, bah, ça va remonter une panne et le pilote aura la panne. Donc ici, nous, à, la, à, à bord du cheval de Gaulle, vous pouvez faire toute la maintenance comme à terre. On est équipé, on, a, on est opérationnel, en mission opérationnelle. On peut faire exactement par, par tout ce qu'on peut faire comme à terre. Donc euh, le banc d'essai ici, à peu près, là, on a pour une fois que le moteur est monté, le point fixe dure à peu près une demi-heure. En une demi-heure, on teste tout. Donc c'est-à-dire que si on vient changer un compresseur ou un carter de PC, tout le moteur va être contrôlé. Pour n'importe quelle partie qui va venir, on va contrôler tout. On a des caméras, on peut zoomer, bien contrôler tout ce qu'il y a à voir là-dessus. Voilà. Donc c'est comme sur l'avion, hein, vous avez tout ce qui est branchement électrique, euh, tout ce qui est arrivé carburant, avec un groupe de carburant. Voilà. Donc nous avons la cabine de pilotage du, du point fixe à côté, avec deux personnes qui viennent exprès pour ça, qui sont lâchées là-dessus et qui viennent contrôler euh, tout le moteur. À l'issue du point fixe, un contrôleur va venir contrôler tout le moteur et le moteur pourra être donné à la flottille. Sachant que là, comme nous avons 24 rafales à bord, il y a pas mal de boulot sur les moteurs. Every year, thousands of innocent people are killed by hidden landmines, clearing them as a major priority for governments and humanitarian organizations. At the German Aerospace Center outside Munich, they're using radar to find potential explosives, and it could dramatically reduce the time it takes to clear them. Each day, around 10 people lose a limb to an explosive remnant of war. More than 100 million mines are buried across 60 countries, many of them the poorest on the planet. And they also prevent communities from using the land for farming. To meet this challenge, German scientists hope a new method of detecting hidden ordnance could lead to the fast and safe clearance of minefields. Here at the German Aerospace Center, they're pushing the capability of radar technology further than ever before. This test bed could one day revolutionize the way landmines are detected. The work is being led by Dr. Marcus Peichel and his colleagues from the center's Microwave and Radar Institute. For their experiments, they use an array of explosive devices. These ones have been made safe and each represents a different challenge. A much more challenging task is if you look to the smaller ones like this one or what you have here and here. And you see that they look very differently, but they are small and mostly they are made purely of plastic. There is only a very small amount of metal inside, which makes it difficult for the metal detector um, to, to detect them. They start off by burying them in a test area under scientific conditions. We bury them in a certain depth in order to see um, as far as we can detect them and we put them as well on the surface in order to see the signal without some contamination by the ground. So we play around with that in order to make sure that in, for each condition we are able to detect the mines or on the other hand to see under which conditions we don't see the mine. Soldiers and humanitarian workers rely on conventional methods like metal detectors or sniffer dogs but these can be slow and dangerous. This unusual looking vehicle could be about to change all that. It applies the same principles of SAR or synthetic aperture radar used in the center satellites to scan the test area for suspicious objects. With that principle, you can move um, the truck where the radar is mounted on, on the safe side, and you're looking to the side into the contaminated area. And by that way, you can perform this scanning of large areas within a reasonable short time. With a satellite using SAR, a small antenna mimics the work of a large one by sending microwave signals towards an illuminated spot on the ground from several different points along the satellite's orbit. The captured data is then used to create a high-resolution image. To find the mines, the scientists benefit from the same process. 
A giant antenna on the side of the truck isn't feasible, so several small ones combine to do the work of a large one. Microwaves can also penetrate the earth. As the vehicle moves forward, the antennae are directed sideways and downwards. Each object reflects radar signals back with varying intensity. With the help of sophisticated algorithms, the driver processes all the echoes into an intensity map. The idea is to sweep one strip of land before moving on to the next. You know the safe area, which is already cleaned, or where you for sure know that it was never contaminated by mines. You can scan along this boundary and take uh, the detections there and later on clean off this area. And then you just shift the whole system to the side and perform the same way uh, the, the second scan of that. This is the first measurement we've made? or It's the first measurement. Which, which are the, the anti-tank mines? Uh, I think it's uh, these two ones because okay. they have the highest amplitude uh, in the uh. image. And as you can see, if I... Uh, yeah, go to the side view that we, we see. side view, you can see that they are buried in depth of approximately 15 centimeters. Okay, which fits well to, yeah. to what we have done there. And this is the end result, a revealing high-resolution image. For the first time, it's possible to quickly scan large areas for suspicious objects. Although SAR can detect an object, the system will need an additional sensor to establish if it contains explosive material. Still, Dr. Peichel's research has already attracted overseas interest. I had a phone call from the uh, uh, ambassador uh, of Egypt and he was asking me if our system already is available and I had to say, no, unfortunately not, because it's just an experimental system. Um, but they have still the problem from Second World War. You know, in Northern Africa, the German and the British groups were fighting against each other. They laid out a lot of landmines there and they are still left there. With landmines, poor countries have the problem, but rich countries have the money. And it will be the West's military that will propel this technology forward. If once you have figured out a company being interested in that and seeing a market in that, and the market by the military guys is much bigger than the one in a humanitarian case, then you can start developing together with this company an operational product which can be used outside in the field. And then, if once such a system uh, is available on the market, the humanitarian community can buy such a system and operate it like that. So you need an aircraft that can transport 300 troops 6,000 miles and has the capability to refuel other aircraft air-to-air. -air. Step forward, the Voyager. It's the biggest aircraft the RAF operates and it might look familiar. It's pretty much an Airbus A330, the sort of plane that you or I might go on our holidays in. But on this very special edition of the Military Tech Show, we'll show you all the cutting-edge tech that makes this variation so special. And I'm going on a mission to refuel a squadron of Typhoon fighter jets. Replacing the old VC-10, the Voyager delivers a new and flexible capability to the Royal Air Force for its military and humanitarian operations. The consortium air tanker, in partnership with the Ministry of Defence and the RAF, was chosen to deliver and maintain the new fleet. Eight Voyagers are currently in service with 10 and 101 squadrons. Each one carries 111 tonnes of fuel, providing air-to-air -air refuelling through its underwing pods. On board, there's capacity for 291 passengers with a payload of 43 tonnes of freight. It can also be set up to provide space for 40 stretchers in a casualty evacuation. Well, this makes it the only aircraft certified to perform three different types of missions simultaneously. Air-to-air -air refuelling, passenger and freight transport and medical evacuation. As you would expect, there is an awful amount of science and technology behind the workings of the Voyager, but it's still only as good as the guys who sit up there, the crew. And particularly in a refuelling mission, the two key players are the pilot and the mission systems operator. So this is where it gets really interesting, and I've been invited onto the flight deck of the Voyager to find out a bit more about it. Gav. Nice to, Hi, meet nice to meet you. Thanks Hi. for letting me on board. Nice a pleasure. And up front. I was going to say this is the business end, of course, but I guess a lot yep. of stuff happens outside by nature of the refueling. But let's deal with this first of all. Yeah, sure. Tell me okay. a bit about the airframe. 
So uh, what you're looking at is uh, it's a fourth generation aircraft. Um, it's one of our most modern aircraft in the fleet. It's the biggest aircraft we've got uh, in the Air Force at the moment in terms of wingspan and size. Um, it's primarily, um, when you look at it and you come on board, it's an A330, an Airbus A330, but we've added to it. So in terms of uh, comparing to a VC-10, which was very much a 1960s aircraft, uh, this aircraft has comes with all sorts of extras, which give the crew extra capacity. The automatics are very, very good, very reliable. Um, the engines are more reliable. Instead of four engines, we've got two engines now. So not only are they more powerful, they're more fuel efficient, they're quieter, they're more reliable, so we only need the two. So we've made room on the wings of a, what would be an A340 um, to take an A330 with the two engines, not four, and put some refueling pods on the wings as well. Uh, the aircraft is flown, as you see, slightly differently now in the newer generation of aircraft. Um, I used to fly the VC-10 and that was um, very much your control column and yoke that you'd expect to see, but these days it's more modern, it's all fly-by-wire. So what, what I do here doesn't go directly to the ailerons, the elevators or the flight controls, it goes through a computer. Um, so I use a side stick here, um, almost like what you would see on an F-16 but in an airliner. Um, the inputs I put into this control here and in the rudder pedals there and indeed the thrust levers here which control the engines um, all go through a computer and are sanitised for safety um, and give us a level of protection uh, and, and, and a, a certain level of intelligence. Um, if I tried for whatever reason let's say to fly the aircraft upside down accidentally or I roll too much the aircraft said it's fourth generation it knows I, it doesn't want to do that. Um, it will take over and will not allow me to roll the aircraft upside down. If I pull too hard back on the stick and the, I was to, let's say I was in a VC-10, I could, I could damage the structural integrity of the aircraft. Uh, but in a Voyager, the aircraft, uh, as matter how hard I pull back on this stick, the aircraft will take over and reduce the pitch to a safe level and not let me do it. And just talking about that, that refueling, when it, when it comes to doing that, talk us through the process from a pilot's point of view. Sure, yeah, so um, once we're, we're there, um, our job is to run the formation and safely get together with our refuelling partners because it's not just parking on a forecourt with a car. The aircraft are moving, um, we're about 20,000 feet, doing about six miles a minute, roughly six to seven miles a minute. The fighters might be coming in quicker depending on what they're doing. So the closing speeds are between 12 and 15 miles a minute. So I need to get an aircraft into that formation with a safe split. So if they miss us or there's cloud and they can't see us or it's night, um, it's safe. And then once they get visual contact with us, they can join on my wing. Once they're there, we can then get them in a position where we can get our refueling hoses out and, and, and give the fuel to them. So it's the same fuel on our aircraft. I can show you a display down here. Um, we carry up to around about 110 tonnes of fuel on board the aircraft, roughly. That's the same fuel that burns through our engines um, that we're going to pass to the other aircraft. So we do that by um, pumping the fuel out at pressure. Um, the fuel is uh, increased in pressure by several refueling pumps as well as our main um, engine pumps. But it essentially goes down the hoses um, at a pressure that's suitable for them. And when they're ready, um, they'll plug in behind the aircraft when we clear them in, uh, make contact, literally plug their probe into our basket and, and the fuel goes. OK, so talk us through the details of that refueling process, some of the gizmos you've got on board to help you do your yeah, job. Yeah, sure. I mean, from the pilot, there's two sides to it. There's the pilot side and our mission system operator side. So from the pilot side, um, we can put the aircraft into an automatic situation to give us some capacity so we can hold the altitude of the aircraft, we can hold the heading and the speed through our flight control unit up here. We've got a display up here which tells us where we are. Uh, I can put on a refuelling track here. Uh, as you can see here, we've got Area 8, which is a refuelling track in the North Sea. That could well be a refuelling track over Iraq or somewhere else in the world. Um, so I know where I'm going. To manage the system, um, we've also got an extra bit of equipment here. So most of your airliners would use this as a, the desk, if you like, and we can still use it as that, or we can have lunch, something we've got to do. Or when it's time to work, um, we can flip out the TV screen and link to what's going on behind us. Uh, and the mission system operator can give us a picture of the back of the aircraft. Um, we can pan left and right uh, to see the refueling hoses and what's going on there as well. Um, we also have a link uh, with a touchscreen display uh, with a moving mouse, and we can bring a tactical display up where I can see exactly where I am who's around me, friendly or foe. Uh, when I'm busy, I can pop that away um, at any time I like. And I can program the equipment to tell it how many receivers we've got in this box here, how much fuel I'm going to give away. And I can monitor how much fuel I have on board on this display here in every fuel tank. Um, as I said, we carry about 110 tonnes of fuel. And I can see that right now I've got three tonnes of fuel in the fin. I've got two and a half tonnes in the wingtip. I've got 10 tonnes in the centre tank, etc. Uh, how the fuel pumps are doing. All the systems on the aircraft that make it work, the hydraulic systems that augment the fuel pumps on board, uh, I can see how the engines are doing, I can check the air conditioning, uh, I can check the pressure in the tyres and temperature in the tyres. It really is modern 
uh, and it's got everything for me right there. Um, but the rest of it happens behind uh, in the Mission System Operators console over there. So Jerry, you are Mission System Operator on the Voyager, most important person on the plane, obviously. Oh, well, we like to think. <laughs> Talk us through your role. Okay, the job of the uh, Mission System Operator, or MSO as we normally call it, is to carry out the air-to-air -air refueling. The pilots uh, get us to the area we want and to coordinate things, but once the uh, receivers arrive, we look after them from the point of joining the aeroplane to receiving their fuel and then immediately prior, uh, prior to just departing them, doing whatever they want to do next. So we control the uh, delivery of the fuel and the movement of the aeroplanes around the rear of the aircraft. Obviously it's a highly regimented uh, process. Just take us through it step by step. How does it work? Uh, well, initially we will have a, a plan at the beginning of the day uh, of which aeroplanes to expect and uh, hopefully they'll appear at their allotted time and uh, join the tanker on the left-hand wingtip uh, stacked up. There might be a queue depending on how busy they are and uh, once they're uh, stable in that position we will then call them to move behind one of the hoses. Uh, this aeroplane has two, some of them have three so we can refuel a larger aircraft from a centerline hose which has a greater flow rate. So we move them behind the hose and uh, when they're again they're stable we uh, clear them to make contact and uh, we use that to one of the pods here and we have a system of traffic lights that uh, we can use if we don't want to speak on the radio for whatever reason to control the procedure. So in this case I'll just uh, select an aeroplane, I've got one here. We do that on our plan, if I put the lights on we get a red light which will tell them not to make contact or if they are in contact to break contact. The system is, is fairly new, I knew you've only been on board for uh, doing this for a couple of months. Yeah. What was it like before this new system came in? How, was your, how does your job compare? It was uh, very different. Uh, I was a flight engineer on the TriStar, which was one of the aeroplanes that the Voyager replaced. And uh, as well as uh, dispensing the fuel, the flight engineer would actually have to manage the entire fuel system, as well as his other duties as being part of the flight crew. Uh, so he would have to make sure the fuel was in the right tanks. He'd selected the right pumps to select the f uh, send the fuel to uh, the dispensing apparatus and uh, equally so we'd have to keep an eye and on uh, what was happening behind the aircraft with the receivers but with a very archaic black and white camera that in the night time was uh, virtually unusable so the panoramic displays we've got here are a revelation really. So how quickly can you get pilots in, refueled and away? Uh, depends on the aircraft type, how good they are and uh, how much fuel they want to take but typically it takes uh, between 10 and 15 minutes to fill an aeroplane up. So. That's pretty quick. quick yeah, job. yeah. But it does sound a little bit like a, you know, a motorway forequarter that they queue on one side. When it's their turn, they come up, they take their fuel, they, they leave in a certain direction. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> I was hoping it was going to be slightly more complicated than that. Well, it is. In fact, if we're travelling at uh, speeds of uh, around 400 miles an hour, uh, because that's relative, we're all travelling at 400 miles an hour. So it's uh, quite interesting to watch the fighters come up very, very gently and uh, get their probe into a basket that's about uh, 45 centimetres in diameter. It's precision flying on their part. Jerry, just talk us through how the cameras work. OK, well, we have uh, a, a, an array of cameras that can uh, used to show pretty much a, a full panoramic view at the rear of the aircraft. We have uh, one on each side that look at the refueling position, so when the hoses trail, they're focused on the position that the receiver will be in. Uh, we also have one looking directly rearwards and we can select the view to uh, look around the aircraft and uh, slew it one way or another. Uh, so, for instance, somebody might suspect they've got some damage, we can use this camera to uh, look at it and we can zoom in. It's very so responsive, it's, isn't it? It pans pretty quickly. It is, really. I'm still uh, getting the hang of it. You can tell I'm not a, uh, an Xbox player. So. <laughs> uh, but we can zoom in on something perhaps on the receiver that they might have a concern about and look at it and describe it to them so they can make a better judgement of uh, what to do next. Obviously, Jerry, you've got to be travelling at the same speed, so for the fast jets they've got to slow down to match your speed, but how does that work with, with an airframe like the Hercules? Well, the Hercules, it's a bit more complicated because it uh, flies considerably slower than we do, uh, so uh, they basically have to fly at uh, as far close to their fastest speed as they can, and uh, we have to come back to what is safe. we can fly as safely as possible at our slowest speed. Obviously, we have safety tolerances within that, and uh, so it can cause a bit of uh, sort of head juggling at times. So the Hercules is kind of running to catch up, essentially. Pretty much, yeah. It's uh, it's it's at uh, the upper end of its speed limit, and we're coming back towards the lower end of ours. Well, that's it for part one. 
coming up after the break. We find out what it takes to service the Voyager, and we take to the skies to refuel a squadron of typhoons. Hello, welcome back to the Military Tech Show. I'm at RAF Bryce Norton in Oxfordshire, and I've been given exclusive behind the scenes access to the RAF's multi role tanker transport aircraft, the Voyager. Now, the Voyager may be completely state of the art, but any aircraft that flies tens of thousands of miles a year is going to need to be maintained to the highest possible standards. Toby Sadler has been inside the hangar to meet the team of specialist engineers that keep it safe and reliable. The RAF's new multi-role aircraft must meet the highest standards of safety and performance, and maintaining this complex machine is in the hands of Air Tanker's team of mechanical and electronics specialists. Civilian, reservist and RAF embedded engineers support and overhaul the aircraft so it's always operationally ready. This is the Voyager hangar and as you can see it is huge. You can fit two of these A330s in here side by side with enough space for the engineers to completely strip them down if that's what's required. And all the work that goes on here is mission critical. Without it the Voyager wouldn't be able to do those key tasks of air to air refuelling and transportation. Maintenance meets civil aviation authority regulations and all the engineers are trained to work on the A330. Ready? Every part of the plane is thoroughly examined, such as the hose and drogue refuelling pod beneath its wing. OK, so what we've got here is we've got the, uh, we've got the drogue assembly and basket assembly. And like I said, this is the business end of it. Uh, and what we actually have, it's just, a it's just a receptacle mm -hmm. for the fast jets probes to, uh, to plug into and start um, receiving fuel. The fast jet will actually engage into this receptacle here and these little rollers, they'll just, uh, they've got like a preset tension on them, they'll just make sure that the receptacle stays mm -hmm. in there and it actually you can't come back out. All right, so at night, um, I guess it's even more difficult, how, how does this help out the pilot? Oh uh, yeah, so at night we've got a, got a row of little lights here, yeah. uh, you can't really see them that well but um, at night time they do, do eliminate quite a lot and they're, they're powered by this little uh, little turbine here that just uses airflow uh, that gets induced yeah. into here, spins it up and that just lights it up. Once they've connected there's a row of traffic lights up on the mm -hmm. pod unit itself and a certain sequence will start happening to tell them that they're yeah. ready to go and then the fast jet pilot will just push forward slightly and the hose will retract in mm -hmm. uh, sort of five metres ish and then it'll, it'll go into a zone then that right. allows it to deliver fuel and then from that point onwards then the, the pod unit itself will just uh, hunt backwards and forwards as the fast jet slows down and speeds up and keep make sure that this uh, hose stays nice and taut and steady in the airflow. And so why is it so important that we have that pipe sort of tension on the pipe? It's just purely because if you start getting uh, any slack or ripples in this mm -hmm. pipe in, in the airflow it can start getting exaggerated more and more and more and, and ultimately it can end up snapping the probe off the fast jet and there's also fuel going to be spraying out and things like that. So. And for you guys in terms of you know, looking after this piece of kit what are you looking out for? One of the main things we look at is that it is fully symmetrical mm -hmm. so as you spread it out like this it's fully symmetrical nice circle all these uh, interwebbings here are all intact because they can get broken sometimes when the probe just misses and pushes because it won't fly straight if it's if it's no no it'll all it'll, no no and also any tears or rips in this uh, canvas sort of sheet around the edge uh, and it is just a general condition thing that's, that's pretty much it what then happens when the pilot needs to, to pull away they've got the tanks full uh, they it's literally as simple as the the fast jet just slows down and uh, when it's once the, the, the preset tension on the rollers inside there once that is exceeded it'll just break away nicely the fast jet pilot goes and does whatever he needs to do full of fuel Able to perform air-to-air -air refuelling while also carrying military personnel and freight, the Voyager uses cutting-edge technology to rewrite the rulebook. And powering the largest plane in the RAF's fleet are two Rolls-Royce Trent turbofans, each producing 72,000 pounds of thrust. The Voyager's safety is paramount and nothing is left to chance. Even a lowly spanner must be accounted for. Engineers have to sign out their tools, check for defects, calibrate them and return them at the end of the job. A spanner left behind in an engine could have catastrophic consequences. At any given moment there could be dozens of RAF aircraft in the skies. There could be Hercules transporting armoured vehicles to exercise in Germany or tornadoes on operations over Iraq. And at any given moment, they could need to refuel in the air. And when that happens, it's the crew of the Voyager who take to the skies to fulfill one of their key roles, air-to-air -air refueling. 
It's dawn at RAF Bryce Norton. In the briefing room, a Voyager crew from 10 and 101 squadrons are making final preparations for their mission. They've been tasked with refueling Typhoon jets from RAF stations Coningsby and Lossiemouth. It's all going to be working in Area 8. Uh, it's the receivers, uh, it's a total of nine typhoons for the, uh, for the hour that we're on task. So call sign then, we are going to be Madras 5-1. Uh, the routing is uh, standard for, uh, for Area 8, so it'll be out through the uh, corridor. Um, passports, visas, all standard. Uh, timings then, so uh, if we're working on an 8.25 takeoff, we'll let's taxi 8.15, uh, start engines at 8.0, uh, so pick up the checks, tempting. Cool. We're refuelling exclusively Typhoon aircraft. Um, it's going to be uh, down in Area 8, which is just off the, uh, the Norfolk coast. Um, and... Uh, yeah, this sort of, we've only got an hour and we've got nine aircraft, so it might be, it's going to be quite sort of busy initially. But, um, yeah. Absolutely. With the brief over, the crew get on board. So we've been given our task for the day. We've had our briefing. We're off to the north Norfolk coast to uh, refuel Typhoon. So let's get on board the voyage. Once there, the two pilots carry out final checks. For a mission like this, every detail counts and they must be fully prepared. Check and break away. The mission systems operator also completes his final preparations. With the checks finished, the Voyager takes off on its mission. Okay, that's uh, wings level, speed is uh, 320 knots. The Voyager soon reaches its mid-air rendezvous point for the refueling and on cue, the first of the Typhoons are just off our wing. With fuel pods on both wings, the Typhoons will take turns to refuel on either side of the aircraft. Track of 280, so uh, can come left a bit just to keep us. For the mission systems operator, this is a critical time. He must carefully choreograph each refueling stage. This is where the Voyager's HD cameras are vital for success. There's an extraordinary amount of technology on show here. But in moments like this, it comes down to old-fashioned piloting skills. Rolling with us on the left. On the right. The pilot has to carefully position his aircraft and connect the nozzle to the extended hose. Yes, he starts to bounce around. Good news, guys, 36 miles. Go on, fella. Get in. Two ones in. While refuelling, the Voyager is able to dispense 80 litres of fuel a second, or 5,000 litres per minute. That's twice as fast as a Formula One pit stop. What's your plan for 2-3? If 2-1's finished well before, because yeah. I, I would think it's got a probably a minute, minute and a half on 2-2. Two, two. Yeah. I'll bring 2-3 two, behind 2-2 two, two and onto the right hose. OK, cool. That's visual with the coverage as well. Half 10. Just under that green layer. Oh, yeah. Sure. Okay, okay. It takes around 10 minutes to refuel a typhoon. Once a typhoon is refueled, it peels away and its place is taken by another one. While all this takes place, the crew of both aircraft talk to each other constantly. They must fly carefully in parallel. Both steady. I'm guessing even though 2 one's going to be complete first, 2-2 two, two will probably be done before you move. 2-3, that what you were thinking? one like just turned. Looks a little bit more stable. With all nine Typhoons refuelled, the mission is complete. And the Voyager heads home to Bryce Norton. Well, there's no doubt that the Voyager is the ultimate in multitasking, air-to-air -air refueler and passenger transport. It should come as no surprise to learn then that it's going to play such a key role in Britain's air defence over the next 30 years. Thanks for watching the Military Tech Show. Bye for now.